Well, welcome everybody. Um, I know that there has been a lot of workshops that are taking place and I'm grateful that you decided to choose uh, Funny Ministry with Five Loaves and Two Fish. This is based on a book that I've written about two years ago and it's everything that I've experienced or close friends. I don't claim to be an expert, but um, I'm hoping that you pick up some nuggets today that you could pass along to your congregation or to different context. Uh, just to give you a background about myself, my name is Rosario Picardo. I go uh, by Roz, and that's because I moved from Western New York to Kentucky where I was living. Folks couldn't say Rosario, so they affectionately nicknamed me Roz, and that has stuck. Um, my experience, uh, I went to Houghton College, and then I spent some time in the Marine Corps and the Navy uh, for nine years in the reserves. So I did uh, was enlisted in the Marine Corps and then I did some chaplaincy work in the Navy. I went to Asbury Theological Seminary and my first staff position at a church was the custodian. Uh, that was my first, my first work. And then after that, um, I planted a church. Um, it was actually what we call a parachute drop. So no money, no people, no building. I think the conference gave me $9,000 to start off. Um, and by the grace of God, we were able uh, to see that grow. We went multi-site, I restarted a church. And then um, a little church in Tip City, Ohio, recruited me to come up called Ginghamsburg Church. And I became the executive pastor of new church development out there and oversaw the campuses. And not only that, developed online campus recovery church. Um, and then I, I launched a church recently that's about to uh, turn two years old called Mosaic Church in Dayton, Ohio. And Mosaic is intentionally multi-ethnic. And um, we have about 15 nations represented in our congregation. And we've had over 40 languages spoken during worship because that's an integral part of our DNA. So that gives you a little bit of background. I'm also... Um, the Dean of the Chapel at United Theological Seminary. You can tell I get bored easily. And um, leader of the uh, executive uh, director of the leadership board there, um, the leadership program. I teach church planting and I lead a doctoral group in church planting. And I also coach church planters around the country. So that's just a little bit about me and my background. So I've served uh, startups, small churches, medium church sized churches, in large churches, and so I've I've done just a bit of, of everything. And today, um, this comes out of a labor of pain. You know, uh, people often tell you to memorize the pain, and it's easy to memorize the pain when you walk into a room and you sit at your first finance meeting and you don't know how to read a spreadsheet. You memorize the pain, don't you? Um, and what I found um, and what I've experienced is um, whether it's seminary or course of study, uh, there's not a lot that prepares pastors for the business and entrepreneurial side of the church today. Meaning we have to look beyond the offering plate because the offering plate is shrinking. That's not a surprise. The offering plate is shrinking. 80% of what people give today, or 80% of givers today in the church are over the age of 55. So think about that. They're over the age of 55. So there are all kinds of needs in our midst. Um, so as I was thinking about this and praying about it, of course, God led me to John chapter 6. And it's one of the greatest stories. Um, you, we hear, hear it preached on so many times. And if before your head hits the pillow tonight, I want to challenge you to read John chapter 6. Uh, because that is the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, which was actually uh, 15 to 20,000, uh, counting women and children, because they do count, right? Um, and that's a whole other workshop and a whole other sermon. But uh, there's this enormous need we see. Um, of course, uh, Jesus is there. And what do we think the miracle is right off the bat in that story? The multiplication right? The multiplication, that, that is the miracle that we see. However, I think there's another miracle, and that's what I want to talk about today. It's the miracle of Andrew noticing the little boy's lunch and saying, look at the five loaves and two fish. 
and started to think differently. And of course, we see a whole process take place. That was the introduction to the miracle that we see. And a lot of times, even today in our communities, um, there's a bunch of needs. And Jesus is saying, hey, the people are hungry. How are we going to feed them? Now, today, people aren't just hungry for food and clothing. They're hungry for a bunch of different things. Uh, being in Dayton, Ohio right now, I'll tell you, we've been hit so hard in recent months. Uh, the first thing is we had the KKK rally come to Dayton. There were about seven of them, but it caused a big ruckus. And in the midst of it, God brought together the churches. Our church helped do an anti-protest. We did it in a peaceful way, just telling them, hey, hate's not welcome here. So... That happened, and then a few days later, Memorial Day, tornadoes, 19 tornadoes. Six, over 600 homes were destroyed. In most of the homes that were destroyed, I was a mile from it. Um, I live in a predominantly African-American community. 80% of my community is African-American, and our community in Trotwood already had uh, struggles with housing values and different things like that. They're the ones that got hit, and then... Um, another side of town got hit where a lot of the homeowners were uninsured. So what do you do when your house is destroyed and you have no insurance money to recover it? So those two things happened. And then a few Saturdays ago, uh, you probably saw it on the news, but there was a mass shooting that took place um, on, on a Saturday night. And that's a place that I've hung out at before. In that area I've done um, a Christmas Eve service down there and so I look at my community and there's a lot of needs there's a lot of needs and so how uh, does God want to meet those needs through my church how does God want to meet those needs through your church your connection and your place um, I'm convinced it all starts with vision first of all you've heard this a million times before vision um, in ministry vision and mission drive ministry um, you know, we, we've heard about it, that, that vision is so important, and yet uh, we don't talk about it enough. Um, as leaders, we have to cast a compelling vision to our congregations. Um, if there are needs in our community, what are some of the ways that God may want to raise up our churches to meet those needs? And so our vision at Mosaic Church, where I pastor, I say it every Sunday morning, we are a dynamic mosaic of Jesus followers. That's our vision. It's short, sweet, and concise. Uh, because a lot of times when we're trying to fundraise or we're asking people to give, we don't mention any vision. And we're not even uh, sold out to it ourselves. Uh, you think about it, um, we live in an era right now where everybody carries student debt and student loans. Uh, churches are in debt. Uh, the, like I said, the number of givers to a local church is decreasing, and yet the number of charitable organizations is increasing, and the church has gotten competition now because people want to give to um, something that they see making a difference. Uh, what are some of those organizations? Purse. Samaritan's Purse. Yeah, they came in during the tornado relief efforts. What are some other ones? United Way. I mean, people are giving dollars toward these different organizations because they see a compelling vision and they see their dollars at work. So how does the church compete with that? It's about casting vision. Um, for me, you know, I want to have my own personal vision. This is kind of my own personal vision statement on what God has given me to be a spiritual entrepreneur and change agent for Jesus Christ. So I know how I'm wired. I'm not going to try to be like somebody else. I can't do it. I got to be authentic and true to who I am. And so a church not only needs to know its identity, but the leader has to know their identity as well. And there are certain ways for us to, to be able to recognize that. Um, when I'm working with young pastors or I'm coaching folk, I ask them, how has God uniquely shaped you? Because every church is called to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. However, that's going to look unique in every different setting. And so how has God shaped you? Um, how has God shaped you individually? And the way that I look at that is the past. 
Um, man, was your church one of the first churches to provide food in a neighborhood or uh, an educational system or, or a daycare? I look at the past. Um, for me, it was like, man, I started to look at how God had wired me to share my faith at a young age uh, when I was a uh, young Christian. I started talking to my parents because I didn't grow up in the church. So I started talking to my parents, my sister, and my friends. So it's no wonder that God has kind of given me that evangelism uh, flair, and I see it played out in church planting. And then, of course, the role of Scripture. Hey, what Scriptures are meaningful to me? How has God spoken to me in that? Um, you know, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5b or c, it says, do the work of an evangelist. Endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist. So that was like my call to ministry verse. And a lot of us have those types of verses. I even tattooed it on my leg as a reminder. Hey, this is what you're about. Don't be ashamed. So knowing your vision is important. And, um, you know, you, you could, um, we don't have time right now because this, <laughs> This normally I do, I could, could spend a whole day talking about all this. Um, we got an hour. So look at those things. And w before your head hits the pillow tonight, I want to challenge you to look at those questions and write your own vision statement for your life. Write your own vision statement for your life. And explore that with your local church too, what that means. Uh, because if you don't know who you are, it's impossible to motivate people to want to contribute to give where their time, talents, and treasures. Amen? Um, so when I cast a vision of people and I see um, in every context I've been in, there's always a struggle for finances. I'm like, God, why do you put me in these situations? Even being at a mega church where I was, I'm like, we're still fighting over the same piece of the pie. What's going on here? And so, um, you know, a lot of it, churches don't have money to hire staff, right? And so one of the things through casting vision, uh, we were able to do, because my dissertation is in bivocational ministry. It's in bivocational ministry because the day of a fully appointed ordained elder is going to be going away soon. And people are going to have to return to actually something called the early church where we got to work. And in that, we're going to interact with the world and, and all those types of things. Uh, and so what I started to do was, hey, I, I have this need. I have a missions pastor. I need, I need this in our community. And we've actually started to raise up uh, what we call local missionaries that would start to raise their own support and be on our staff team. Or we've had, even right now, we have a director of discipleship at our church who is unpaid. See, our instinct is to just pay people. We're not trying to rip them off, but we're trying to look at their God passion and pour gasoline on their burning bush. And so uh, our, our instinct is to just pay. You don't have to pay everybody. So another way you can look at it is um, through internships. Do you have colleges? Do you have seminaries? Places around... Um, you know, you could find a worship leader at a local college. There might be somebody in your midst. Uh, there might be someone that you don't have to pay right away, but see, I, I'm hesitant to just pay people if I don't see fruit or hear about fruit. I always tell people, you, you work your way up to full time. And so uh, I have um, a large staff, but many of them are bivocational or unpaid. I still have strong accountability standards, and I still uh, manage them and help them, but they all bought into the vision. Are you hearing that? They all bought into the vision. So whether I was in Lexington or Troutwood and now Dayton, they all bought into the vision and said, yeah, we're willing to sign up for that. That's why vision is so important. Because people, I mean, think about it. Jesus said to the disciples, follow me. And they dropped their nets and they followed them. But there was a vision that was cast to them. How do we do that for our congregations? Um, one of the things that I started to do that I learned uh, was called uh, kingdom investors. You know, we hear about like stakeholder meetings or investor meetings. Your congregation uh, wants to give, but a lot of them don't know where you're headed. So at these things I call kingdom investors, uh, it looks like this. I don't have enough money to buy everybody dinner, right? So I do dessert and coffee. 
You could do dessert and coffee in your home or at the church. You could do dinner, whatever it may be. And I kind of give a state of the church, and I do this three times a year. I do this to tell people where we've been. I do this to thank the people for their contributions and efforts. And then I cast compelling vision of where we feel God wants to take us. And so as we started to do this, even in my current plant, we are now self-sustaining after uh, a year and a half, which is very rare. But it was because I started doing these kingdom investors. I'm like, here's our weekly average in giving. As soon as I um, told them our weekly average and where we want to be within six months, uh, we added maybe 1100 extra dollars a week to the offering because people started to believe in the vision and we gave them transparency. We gave them where we were at in reality. Uh, and we shared, we gave them a time to answer, ask questions and not be afraid, ask anything. Uh, now, some wanted me to ask about UMC questions. A lot of our folks don't know we're UMC. So um, even though I preach Wesleyan theology and they hear sanctification and all that, they're not coming to our church because we're a United Methodist. They're coming because they see God at work. Um, so. Kingdom Investor, great way to cast vision. I do this three times a year. And if you're not doing it, you should start your own version of something like that because this has helped so many ways. Um, I've had people um, say, hey, I told people, I want to get a school bus and I want to kind of pimp it out. And um, because we have a lot of refugees that we're uh, picking up and, and we're uh, taking them through our nonprofit that we're doing. And so someone's like, hey, we want to buy you a school bus now but they heard about it at a kingdom investors and there was compelling vision. Um, another thing that, that we've done, um, and this is from Mike Slaughter and I've kind of created my own way of doing this called the Christmas miracle offering, right? Uh, challenging people on how much they spend at their church or at Christmas time to give an equal or greater amount to the local church an equal or greater amount to the local church. And so we select different causes in doing that, whether it's jobs, whether it's homes. Um, we've done it for our recovery communities because we're a recovery church as well. And so we partner with 10 local um, recovery for men. And now uh, we help start a maternity house too. And it was through things like the miracle offering. So special time over and above your giving is what we challenge people to do. And so at times we're like, um, maybe it's Good Friday, we give away the offering. Times that you wouldn't take up an offering, we do to give to somebody else. And that helps create goodwill and it increases generosity. Um, this is one of the people that we featured um, a few years ago during the Christmas offering. Her name is Missy. Check out her story. Relationships across economic and social class lines 
with the goal of ending poverty in our community. Through the ups and downs, cooking has been my constant. I've always dreamed of owning my own catering business. To help me reach my dream, New Pack hired me as an intern in a cooking position. Here, let me help you. Clubhouse, an after school tutoring program through Gainsburg, is giving me the opportunity to cook meals for children at the point, the fort, and Five Oaks neighborhood in Dayton. I have a small crew of teens from YouthWorks that work for me, and I love having young people in the kitchen. It gives me the opportunity to teach them what I have learned. Well, what, what Miss Heaney is teaching me not is how to cook, but she, I don't consider her as a coach to teach me about the game of life. The biggest thing I've learned through it all, the power of God giving us a second chance. What excites me the most is that I'm very close to opening my catering business. All the training I've received through Fort McKinley Church and New Path has empowered me to fulfill my dreams. I've recently learned that the Christmas Miracle Offering supports most of the programs that have helped me to my feet. And for that, I say thank you. This is my life now, and I can't imagine it any other way. So people don't want to give to pay a light bill? That That's not you know, vision casting really. They don't want to really give to a roof um, repair, even though that's important. They want to go to change lives. And so even if it's partnering with different organizations in your community, the goal is to increase people's generosity because it's a discipleship issue. It's not what we want from people, but it's what we want for people. We don't want their money. We want their heart. We want their heart to be involved in it. So the first uh, loaf is vision, as we said. The second is assets. Um, you know, in the case of, uh, you know, the, the little boy, it was the five loaves and two fish, right? So what are your assets? Um, you know, John Wesley uh, once said, the world is my parish, right? Uh, you know, and we know about the history, about going out on horseback and being able to uh, bring the gospel to coal miners and other folks. But as Methodism started to grow in England and in other parts, these uh, interesting things started to be erected called buildings, right? This is what he says about buildings, church buildings. Wesley stated, let all our chapels be built plain, and de decent, but not more expensively than is absolutely unavoidable. Otherwise, the necessity of raising money will make rich men necessary for us. Man, if I posted that on social media, I'd get hated on probably. Uh, but what if we must be dependent on them, yay, and governed by them in the farewell to the Methodist discipline, if not doctrine too. Wesley wanted church buildings to be simple and functional rather than extravagant. And so I've always viewed buildings as a ministry center. That's what I've called it. And so when we were, when I planted my first church, we were in a movie theater. And as we were um, trying to uh, purchase a building, God opened another opportunity, and that was to repurpose. Uh, an existing congregation. Ironically, it was the congregation I was the custodian at in seminary. And this was a, a flagship church. It was the bishop-making church. Um, the, it was a suburban area, but the community around it changed, right? The community around it changed. The church got down to about 30 white people. It was a destination church. Meanwhile, we had Hispanics, refugees from Rwanda, all the parts around there. We had a trailer park behind the church, and the church didn't interact with the community. It divorced themselves from the community. Meanwhile, we had uh, elementary school right across the street. Plenty of opportunity. And so when I got there, I said, how can we turn this into a ministry center? Our assets, the building. And sometimes we've got to get off our ass-ets, right? <laughs> and, and use them and utilize them. And so that's what we started to do. So I, I started to look, okay, uh, what do we have, first of all, in our building? We need to, sometimes you've got to exercise demons out. Amen. And I'm not just talking about from people. It's from buildings, too. And you've got to sanctify them. 
and, and get rid of it. So we started, we wanted, we wanted to welcome the nations in our church. And so um, I still inherited some of the people from the existing congregation. They didn't know quite what to do with me. And, and I didn't have like the training on, because I'm a church planter. It's like sending Rambo into a situation. Um, so I started to take down all the America's Next Top Model, blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, white Jesus photos, because we want to be welcoming to our, our brothers and sisters from other um, countries and ethnicities. Uh, we started to transform the building. And then I started to look at um, what assets do we have? And we had these things. What are these things? So I found out, man, these suckers are worth a lot of money. And we hadn't had a handbell choir in 30 years. Um, and so I sold them out of the back of the church in the parking lot. And, and I got $15,000 for them. And that went toward our roof repair because the, we were the first, I was the first pastor to repair and fix the roof in like 50 years. It was crazy because they just did patchwork. But that was our asset. And we utilized it. Then I started to think, okay, how can we use this building for ministry? We have an elementary school right across the street. Um, 90 to 95% of the kids were on free or reduced lunch. And as Olu said, and I've seen it, um, kids came back underweight in the fall because they didn't eat in the summer, really, for a variety of factors. And that's a whole nother topic. And so we started to say, how can we uh, do a backpack program? Well, we don't have the cash to do, you know, buy things, but we started to cast a vision, partnered with other church. One church took up an offering to fund this backpack program. They collected $30,000 in an offering, one offering just for this. Um, but it came out of our church and it was connected to our church and, and the kids were blessed. And then we started to look, okay, we have this space um, and they, when public schools cut funding, what, what do they usually cut? What programs? After school program. So we, okay. So you named a few after school program, art and music and those type of things. So um, we noticed something in our youth group, uh, in our children's ministry. We were winning kids to Jesus, but they were flunking school. So then we started a nonprofit called Common Good. And that's grown now. Uh, they have over a million dollar budget from what I'm told. Uh, we renovated the basement and uh, made it just a great area, partnered with local businesses. So all of a sudden we have 100 kids coming to our after school program from the community. So it was through a nonprofit, but it was through using the assets of what we needed, uh, the space. Uh, and then we said, oh, wait a minute. Um, they cut the music program. And then someone came to us um, that wanted to start a music program for those kids, an after-school program. And so you, you have 100 kids already. Add another 50 kids that are upstairs learning instruments. It was the noisiest, most awful music at times, but the most beautiful music at the same time. It was my favorite part of the day. Those kids were coming in. Guess where they would do concerts then? At the church and they would invite mom and dad and teachers and aunts and uncles, grandparents, and they started to come in. So overnight, we had 150 kids. Um, and then we started to think like that. Oh, um, they had a, a, a clothing bank. And we said, man, there's already a clothing bank down the street. Let's not do that. However, um, the mission down the street has some social workers, and, and we're really in need of that. So I gave them office space because they were able to serve our folk. Um, and by the way, the music program generated enough revenue to pay rent, which we willingly accepted. The after-school program grew because I told you their budget's over a million dollars now. They started to help contribute funding the church as well. So all of a sudden, we started to see this crazy growth. Um, one of the things that I noticed, too, at the church was we had this uh, parking lot that we never used. It was a sinkhole, pretty much. And I said, man, what, why don't we just sell that? And um, I called a realtor, posted a sign, and I didn't know anything about trustees and any of that. <laughs> so when they asked me about that trustees approval, I, uh, I just talked to the trustees and said, this is what we're doing. They said, okay. Um, I had a Christian developer contact me and say, hey, we want to partner with you. 
I'm like, well, what do you want to do? And uh, this is what they wanted to do. Um, 80 units of housing, micro units, with um, uh, $600 a rent a month with utilities included. It's mixed use housing where that's where you experience transformation when people that are different come together socioeconomically and all that. And they want to build shops in the basement that are going to create jobs, a laundromat, other things like that. We can use a community center as the church. They're going to do the church's landscaping. So all of a sudden, now the church is over here. Then there's another building. We have 80 units. The church has become a campus in an area of town that is now being regentrified. Um, and so this has been a game changer. And not only that, we got a lump sum of money. They're going to maintain everything for us. And the church has become the center of the community. And it was all because I was willing to say, hey, that land that you think is a sinkhole, let's just, let's try this. Um, so I do want you to do this part. Think to yourself right now. I'm going to give you two minutes. Uh, what are assets you currently have that you aren't using and how your community can use your building and how much of your building is used during the week? Uh, because here's a, a statistic for you on that. Um, about the average use. On average, a church is using only 32% of the space they have available on a given Sunday. And the same congregations use only about 25% of their sanctuary seating capacity and are spending more than a third of their budgets on heating and cooling for all their space, most of which is not used. So with that in mind, uh, let's just take a few moments now and, and go ahead and write that out. Think to yourself. And if you're not serving a church, maybe you're a part of a church. Think about that. So go ahead. Take another minute or so. It's okay if you can't think right now, but seriously, bring this question with you back home. Talk to your folks. All right, does anybody want to share? You don't have to, but does anybody want to share their answer or answers? Yes, sir. Something I've been thinking about. So uh, we have five acres of land. Mm -hmm. Not all usable, some of it's wetland, but a lot of it is usable. And uh, we have an empty parking lot that can never get used, the second parking lot. We have a fellowship hall that's rarely used, except by the church maybe three times a month. Kitchen, nice industrial strength kitchen too. Classroom and stage, which we don't use. We have classrooms that are used, but we have one with stage playing. Uh, Sanctuary is only used one hour a week, one and a half hour. Uh, we have drums, PA, another band equipment that sits most of the time, and we have probably three or four pianos we just don't need. Hmm. All right. So some opportunities out of that. What else? What what came to mind for some of you? 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, huge square footage. There's a um, 12 step meeting that comes in on Thursday. Mm-hmm. We do band rehearsal on Wednesday, and we do church on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. So there's, there's possibilities and opportunities. Um, a few other things we did we created um, a, a studio for photography that people started doing that. They started. Um, the University of Kentucky started to come in and um, do some of their concerts there. Um, and we hosted some of the bands um, uh, for a place to even practice. Uh, uh, some other things that we did, uh, we had a commercial kitchen. And so um, we started doing uh, cooking classes. Another organization took that over and started doing uh, the community garden that we had. See, you don't have to do it all. And that's where churches make um, a vital mistake. Uh, partnering is huge. And that's a lot of what Oli was talking about yesterday. That's what I've done. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, if someone has a great event, the church doesn't have to do necessarily their own event. For example, um, when we were planting our, our church, uh, we partnered with Parks and Rec. Everywhere I've been, I've partnered with Parks and Rec. Uh, because usually they're underfunded depending on the community you're in. So I've done in Trotwood, we did a block party, first time fireworks, uh, 5,000 people came out. In uh, Beaver Creek, uh, we did um, uh, Fly Kite Day. And we're a new church, we attached our name to it. We had a booth um, and we just like cooked out and offered that to folk and we were able to make contacts, but it's because we partnered. So you don't have to necessarily do your own event and it's going to keep your cost down as well. So be thinking in those terms, um, Easter egg hunts, things like that. Uh, where I've really learned about partnering was from a brewery, um, believe it or not. Uh, and this was West Six Brewing Company um, and, and they have like 100,000 square feet. This was an old bread factory and I first went there about 10 years ago. And here's who meets in the in this brewery, okay? You ready for it? Um, Broke Spoke Community Bike Shop, which is a nonprofit helping people repair their bikes and learning a trade in that. Uh, the Roller Girls of Central Kentucky uh, meet there to practice. The Plantery, which is a co-working uh, space. The Bread Box Studio Artist, which is professionals working in communal art. And then uh, Food Chain, which is an urban agricultural nonprofit. Uh, and then, ironically, Smith Fo Smithtown Seafood um, opened up their restaurant, partnering with Food Chain for their newest farm to table restaurant where everything on the menu is made from scratch. And then there was Bluegrass Distillers, Magic Beans Coffee Roasters, and then Cricket Press, a design and poster printing operation. Um, they want to give back to the community and so through all of those efforts with west six they give back six percent of what they bring in back to the community and so a few years ago their total giving uh raised uh through this was a hundred thousand dollars back to the community that's most you know that's more than most churches but they were able to have the vision of partnering. And so I started to think, how can we really be able to do this in our community with different organizations? Uh, the church that I revitalized called The Point, um, and I mentioned to some of you who were in my session yesterday, I inherited a church that had about 30 people in it. They were worshiping on Saturday night, and when you worship on Saturday night in an African-American community, they ask the question, what religion are you? because it doesn't make sense to them. And I came into the point um, knowing that this shopping strip was bought by the United Methodist Church about 20 years ago, and there was a new church start there. It did really well, um, but the pastor had some indiscretions and actually stole money, fled the country, and was never found again to this day. He embezzled over a million dollars. So talk about a black eye in the community. And then there was another congregation that came in there, non-United Methodist, but the Methodist, you know, kind of worked out a deal with them. Well, in the end, they ended up suing uh, the district somehow. So that had another black eye. Boom. Then 
it gets better. Uh, my predecessor um, was about to launch Sunday morning services there, and he was let go like two days before, and they had to pull the plug. So that's what I was walking into. It was a nightmare. Um, but everybody looked at the shopping strip as an eyesore in the community um, because there was an old bar attached to it where a number of shootings had taken place. Uh, the last one was with a 16-year-old boy, and the bar shut down, but there was a visible reminder, hey, this is, you know, this is a place of pain and hurt. And um, there, it was all empty when I got there, and the district didn't know what to do. So I started to say, well, who can we partner with? Um, a natural partner that the church wasn't working with was the YMCA. It was meeting right there. And so guess where my wife and I started to work out at? The YMCA. Guess where we'd start to get to know people? At the YMCA. Um, I started to do things like, if you want to get to know your community and partner, do a police ride along. Um, I call this cultural exegesis, uh, like you would understand scripture and look at the exegetical framework, authorship, all those things that they teach you in a uh, course of study or seminary. I started to apply that to the community, and I started to ask myself three questions. Uh, what are the greatest strengths? Because every community has strengths. That's why we start with that. Uh, what are the greatest strengths? What are the opportunities and what are the, uh, or what are the threats and what are the opportunities? Based on the threats or the needs, that dictates what your ministry should look like. So I learned, oh, wait a minute, Troutwood had a great sense of pride. Oh, the housing market really crashed, though, in, in, in uh, 2008. Um, but before that, Best Buy, Walmart, Target all closed, all the restaurants closed. So that's what I was walking into in that given community. So what can we do? How can this be the center of the community and spark revitalization? And so we said, we need a partner because we can't do it alone. Can't do it alone. And so we knew some of the needs were, hey, um, from the police ride along, I learned the kids are bored. They get themselves in trouble. And the school system was so desperate, they started letting us pass out flyers in the public schools to let them know, hey, we're having a dance party for middle school kids and high school kids. And we started to have free movie nights. Well, guess what? Doing a movie night, to bring a family of five to a movie or a family of three even, that's expensive, um, especially in my community where I was at. Um, and so, man, we just get a DVD Get it from Redbox, right? It's less than two bucks. Get that, and we got popcorn donated. And then we had concessions. It didn't cost us anything, and about 80% of the kids and families that would come in, guess what? Weren't affiliated with any kind of church at all. Easy event, but we partnered. Partnered with the schools. Um, I, I went and met with the mayor. If you're out talking to your public officials, um, you need to. And, I, and the one question I asked her was, what keeps you up at night? Because you learn a lot about a leader by asking that question. And she said, the work is never done because we're in a challenging community. Well, as we started to partner and, and do different things, we started to get the whole space rented out. But here's the thing. Um, churches that rent space, there's a caution behind this. Um, it has to align with your vision. Because you're not in the rent business, you're not in the landlord business or um, and doing those things. I chose partners, whether I was in Lexington or in Dayton, that closely aligned to helping the community. Which meant I had to say no to the VFW when they wanted to do alcohol, even though I drink and I don't have anything against drinking, but I couldn't do that and be a part of that. So I had to say no, I'm a veteran. But I had to say no to that just for the, the community. Um, there are certain other organizations, hey, this isn't going to be a good fit. So you need to really align and not just be desperate. And, and when you're running out space and you're thinking creatively about space and, and in that partnership, don't rent yourself out of ministry. And what I mean by that is um, you can book yourself out of ministry by giving away all of your space. That's not what I'm saying. Use it as an asset. And so um, 
you know, we, we closed down Saturday night service. I had people upset and angry with me. I had uh, only a few months to get to know people because I knew that this church would close quickly if I didn't act. I was new in the community. So I started building contacts like they, you know, talk about. I was meeting 25 to 30 people a week. I would get my hair cut at the local barber shop when I had hair. I, um, <laughs> I you know, ate at the restaurants where they did. I, I immersed myself fully in that community and in the culture. Um, I moved into the neighborhood too. And so I started to think about how can we partner and work together. Sunday morning service started. Then we added a second and we went from 30 to 250 in a place that was depressed and a place that was uh, really struggling became a center in the community with that shopping strip and it, can, it created a spirit that was contagious. Check out just, uh, these are just some little clips of, of the Point Church now. Oh, not that one. I'll show you that one after. Almost brings me to tears every time I see that video um, and seeing what's possible, you know, what God can do. Um, you notice, like, we're doing breakfast. Well, we were partnering with local organizations. I had somebody that said, hey, um, you know, eggs are expensive. And they were like, hey, we work at, like, a ch uh, chicken coop kind of deal. We're going to bring you free eggs. I mean, that's quite an expense. So we started, started thinking... Okay, instead of just always buying things, what can we do to partner? Um, not have time now, but ask yourself this question. Who are the potential partners in your community? Who are the potential partners in your community? 
um, because those partners, man, um, they may have something you don't have. They may have resources for different things that can meet the needs of the people around you. Um, the final loaf is funding. Um, I know that's what you came for, funding. Um, and really, what you do on Sunday morning matters. It's, to me, it's about communication. Um, they're asking, hey, does my giving make a difference? Do I matter to my faith community? How my resources will be used? I mean, these are huge things. Uh, the church is unique from any nonprofit in the country because you have 52 opportunities every year to ask for resources. Um, and so in this communication, it's important um, to develop more on-ramps of giving. So of course, man, uh, you do your kingdom investors, you gotta do online giving. Um, you have to um, allow uh, people to understand why they're giving and create that culture of generosity. So you gotta preach on it. Uh, they teach church planter this, this. They try to really instill this in young leaders because you have to be sustainable. So um, if giving and generosity is a part of discipleship, don't just do a series every year. Um, you got to preach it. And so um, I'm very intentional about preaching not only a series, but when, when I can weave it in and it makes sense to do, I'm sharing about generosity. I'm sharing about my own story. Hey, I was in debt coming out of seminary, but guess what? The temptation was not to tithe, right? Uh, because I'm a debt. But God would say, no, I want you to tithe. I want you to give. And so I started to do that. And anytime I got a gift for my birthday or what Christmas, guess what I was doing? Paying off my debt. And today I'm debt free and I'm able to give. And I don't, I'm just telling you what God's possible. I give away 30% of my income, not just to the church, but nonprofits and different things like God's blessed me. I believe in this stuff. I'm a testimony of that. So I preach it. Um, I teach it. So we want people to have financial freedom. So what, you know, as part of your discipleship on-ramp, are you offering something like Dave Ramsey? Um, I'm not, like, that's helpful. I'm not a huge fan, though. I, re I'm, I prefer Crown Financial Ministries because it's more scriptural based on giving and generosity. Um, so I, I kind of look at that. And it talks about giving instead of just getting rich. Um, and you got to celebrate your people. So, um, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, during the tornado relief efforts, we were able to collect $10,000. That's big for a new church to be able to do that. And it went to uh, purchase backpacks for some of the kids that will be delayed going to school. Um, and so, uh, because of the tornadoes. So, man, we celebrated. We brought the backpacks in. We prayed over them. And uh, we said, hey, this is through your generosity. Look at these backpacks. This was what God was able to do through you. Um, and of course, you model it. Are you doing this yourself? You can't ask other people to do something that you're not willing to do. Um, a, another easy thing that churches overlook, you got to be in. I'm telling you, there's consultants that will charge churches $50,000 to teach to just go over what I'm going over with you right now. I'm, I'm serious because I've I've seen it. Um, more intentionality and focus during the time of offering. How many times have you seen a church just say, all right, it's time for the offering. Ushers, we come up. There's no vision casting. There's no stories of transformation. None of that. It's nothing that's really going to say, hey, why should I give? How is my giving matter? So every time we've actually moved our giving moment to the end after the sermon as a part of a response. So the response is, let's give our whole selves over to God. Um, if you need prayer, laying on hands, anointing oil, hey, we have our prayer ramp um, in the theater. We'd love to pray for you. Also, it's time to give back to God uh, with our finances as well. You can do that through a number of ways. Boom, boom, boom. And by the way, this past week, uh, we have uh, seen um, God bless us through your generosity and giving. And because of that, we had um, 32 baptisms on Easter. Cast vision along with that and do it through the power of story. Um, you know, teach the theology of giving. It builds a sense of trust. Um, 
and that's how you develop high capacity givers. Um, I know we're running out of time, but um, I do this through video story. You, you don't have to use video necessarily if you don't have the resource. Use your iPhone and create a cool program. You can um, have live stories. Um, how is God encouraging people to be generous in your community? And what it does, it's creates a, it, it creates vision for people to be able to uh, feed into. Another way of funding ministry, of course, 501c3s. Why are 501c3s different than local churches? Come on. Come on, folks. State and government funding. It separates you because churches aren't going to be able to apply for the same grants. So uh, we have started uh, a 501c3 called House for All Nations. And our goal is to do like, um, you know, uh, citizenship, ESL classes, all that, which is a ministry of the church. But now, guess what? The church doesn't have to fund it. It's funded through the nonprofit. Um, one of my uh, best friends in, uh, is uh, Rudy, not Beyonce. Um, Rudy Rasmus has done this very well. Of course, he has Beyonce in his congregation. doesn't hurt, right? Um, but he's been able to do a bunch of housing developments and all that through these 501c3s that he has started to fund ministry and apply for grants and do those things. Um, so that you know i have more of this information in the book and i didn't bring copies with me but you can go on cokesbury and find information um and i do uh coaching like i said as well uh so you can find a lot of this material i don't have a lot of time to go over it today but the fifth one is outreach uh fifth loaf and we've done just inexpensive things um like, we did kickball with the cops and community helpers. Guess what? That was an outreach. It was goodwill in the community. It was free to play kickball. And then we had, like, Papa John say, hey, we'll donate pizzas. All of a sudden, I have an event, and I have 500 people show up, and I don't have to spend a penny. Um, think about what's already going on. Uh, coffee with the cops, same thing. Um, we didn't have to buy the coffee. The police department did. And they even brought the donuts. Uh, this was priceless, man. This was one of the pictures that was taken and this just happened so organically and I caught it uh, he's tying a little boy's shoe a white police officer an African-American boy uh, what a picture that is especially in our world today and the tensions that we've experienced and seen um, so there's a, a lot of those are the five loaves so what are the fish um, this is the most important thing Prayer. Um, so, you know, what are your prayer efforts and how do you multiply those efforts? Everywhere I've gone, my wife and I have started a prayer ministry. We pray through the building because you got to cast those demons out of the buildings. Um, we pray um, over chairs. Um, you know, she's the vice president of development at United Theological Seminary. She's in front and raising. She's, she, God's telling her to pray over uh, even the statements and, and the finances. Lay hands and pray. Um, and I believe that. Uh, work is everything depends on you and pray is everything depends on God, right? St. Augustine said that. And, and I really, I've seen God move mountains in so many ways. Um, I'm going to put forth the effort, but I'm going to pray too. And having that prayer, pray for your church. Uh, pray not only for your church, but for opportunities in, in the community. So what prayer efforts exist in your church and how can you multiply those efforts? It's not just about money. And it's not just about doing good outreach because, hey, there's communities um, they gather together, uh, they have good outreach programs, and yeah, uh, they'll collect some checks. They're called the Kiwanis Club, right? They do some good things, but man, we're different than any other organization because we serve the living God. And then, of course, uh, the, uh, the second fish is teams. So when the disciples uh, were given the loaves and the bread, uh, they were assembled into teams and they dispersed it. It wasn't chaos. It was orderly. There was a delivery system in place. Someone had to deliver the fish and the loaves. So you can't do it on your own. Um, your finance team can't do it on their own. 
And, and you need people of vision when it comes to even handling the resources of the church. Um, I don't let anybody be on my leadership board if they're not tithing. Hello? How many people are on your boards that aren't giving? Especially your finances. I don't hire any staff if they're willing not to. It's one of the spiritual requirements. Um, there's more on this um, in my book, Funny Ministry. Um, you know, I go through a lot of this and I share some other stories as well. You can uh, pick up a copy, um, Amazon or Cokesbury. Um, and I do coaching too if you need to reach out. Love to, um, to work with you. I, I love coaching churches and church planters because um, my wife says it's my outlet, so it prevents me from planting another church and we can actually live in the same house. Uh, we lived in um, our third house now, and this is five years, so it's the longest stretch. And she's like, yes, thank you, God, but I'm already talking about, we're, we're out, you know, we need to move. I, I love change, I'm high change. Um, can't always do that when a one-year-old and a two-year-old now. So, um, and then um, I have a, a doctoral group um, that I help lead with Vance Ross and Rudy Rasmus, and um, it's church planting and revitalization. So if you want to get your uh, D-men and you're interested in that, uh, there's different focus groups, and we have someone from United here as well that is, um, can give you information. Um, we Not only the, the D-men is really addressing uh, a, one problem in your congregation or your context, and bringing a solution to it. So it's very practical, it's not just head theory. And so we'll, you know, we'll go take a visit. Um, we're talking to Rudy right now. Hey, let's go to St. John's. Um, you did all these housing developments, you did House of Bread, you've done these. Hey, let's go to Washington, D.C. where Joe Daniels um, just did a $50 million building program. Guess what? None of that money came from the church, it came from the government through his 501c3. So how do we do these things? How do we take advantage of it? Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, there's my email address. Uh, there's my phone number. I give my phone number to anybody. Just don't call me, text me. Um, you know, because I hate phone calls. I, I I'm not a millennial, but I, I just, I, I can't do calls anymore. It, it just exhausts me. I'm an extrovert, but I don't like talking on the phone. Um, so text me, and then we can set up a time to talk, but that's the best way to do it. And then you could uh, check out my website, picardocoaching.com. If you have any questions, stick around. I'll be here for a little bit, and I'll be here uh, throughout tomorrow, too. That's what I got, folks. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Hope it was helpful. And an hour is not enough time to go through this, all this material. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. So, I got a question. Yes, ma'am. So, how do you, so what are your thoughts mm -hmm. with, all right, so, I started my own nonprofit. Yeah. Um, focusing on prison ministry. Yeah. And um, so, now I just got assigned to a You're new at, church plan. With, with Journey. What's your role there? Are you an associate or you you don't know yet? Right. We'll see how it so, works out. Right. So I'm not, I, I'm, I don't want to, I'm a lay person. Awesome. So, and, but I'm a part of the worship team. Yeah. Right? So still trying to find my way. I know yeah. that there is a title for me. Yeah. But we just ain't got there yet. Yeah. Um, we don't even have a business office yeah. yet. Yeah. So we're still Right, right, right. But do you think that there is... Like, I don't believe everything, anything happens by accident. accident. yeah. So is there this thing that says, okay, well, Marsha's got her own nonprofit, and she's also a part of the congregation. Can we partner with Marsha, or is there this oh. thing that says Rudy, that's Rudy's not a the good idea? Rudy's the president of his, mm -hmm. and okay. um, I started ours at the church. Now, I, let, I want someone else to be the executive director. Okay. But, yeah, that's... Um, Ginghamsburg's done the same thing. They have like, they have five nonprofits: counseling, food, all these different things. But they do it because it's a ministry of the church, but it's not. So, 
our ESL we do, yes, it's a part of the church, but the church isn't funding it, you see? Uh, okay. So we got to get creative. And you got to get creative. So if you have that and you want to do, hey, re-entry and you're thinking about all those things, I mean, the church could be a perfect fit. Yeah. It's supposed to be. Yeah. It's a struggling. Yeah. Nonprofit organization, yeah. and I've always said I shouldn't be struggling with so yeah. many churches. Yeah. Well, and being in a church, then you can cast a vision. You can be a partner. So instead of uh, I forgot to mention this, but like you know how when people come, you give them a welcome bag and all this.